So I wanted to in, in, um, invite you all to look at these packets, which you're going to do downstairs, right? So each week we've been looking at different things. This week is about we know God by what God says, right? Last week was by what God does. The Bible is full of a bunch of different times where God speaks. One of those is he says, let there be light, and that's the beginning of all of creation, right? So even the, in speaking creation. Um, in this package, you have a crossword puzzle, puzzle that asks questions, and all of these answers and questions have to do with the um, with, it, with a time where God spoke to people in the Bible. And so the answer is usually the person that God is speaking to. So, for instance, um, God told him to leave Ur and go to a new land where he would be promised. Isn't that one? That's Abram, right? From Abraham. Um, prophet who, when called, was shown a valley of dry bones. Ezekiel saw them dry bones. So there's some ones here that you might have to do a little thinking and study about. Mom might have to help you. Um, the big thing that I want to show you is this. Remember in history class, and you, I think you did this too, we had the, oh, yeah. we made the walnut ink, right? And we, we wrote what was called, like the monks in the medieval time, we did the lumen pages. And these are some examples of what a lumen pages look like. Um, and sometimes they have really kind of neat little Celtic knots. Here's a Celtic knot heart. Here's a Celtic knot cross. Here's a little symbol with a interwoven lilies um, and a lion. A There's a, a picture of a, of a Celtic understanding of a tree of life. Yeah. We have that in, in our house in some different places. Um, and so the idea is you're going to take this prayer on the back here, Expressions of Faith, that says, Lord, you have always given bread for the coming day, and though I am poor, today I believe. Lord, you have always given strength for the coming day, and though I am weak, today I believe. Lord, you have always given peace for the coming day, and though of anxious heart, today I believe. Lord, you have always kept me safe in trials, and now tried as I am, today I believe. Lord, you have always marked the road for the coming day, and though it may be hidden, today I believe. Lord, you have always lightened this darkness of mine, and though the night is here today, I believe. Lord, you have always spoken when the time was right, and now those you be silent now, today I believe. Right. So this is the, the sense of the idea of this poem is you look back on your life and all of the things that God had done, and you let that inform your, tell you about why you shouldn't worry about now, right? God's always come through before, and though it seems like he's not right now, I have faith that he will. And so you're going to take this and color it and decorate it and put symbols and all different kinds of things however you want to do it, right? This, Coralie already did it this morning, so I want to show you hers. She took and showed there's the kind of the colors are like the rainbow, and she drew um, a hug from her mom, and strength and weakness, and all of these different symbols on here that informs a little bit more. And it's color, co it's color coded to match what the picture is with the lines that she did. So you can kind of check that out. It's pretty cool. um, so if you all would do that, and then we'll put them up on, on the Facebook group, and people can see and other kids might be able to see what they might want to do with this project at their home. Does that sound good? You guys want to do that? You want to do that? <laughs> right? All right, so let's, let's pray and we'll thank God for um, all of the things that he has done for us that give us faith and hope in the future. Heavenly Father, we take the words of that expressions of faith and we take them to heart. We think about all the times that you've come through for us. And on times when we're afraid, times when we feel weak, times when we don't know what the next path, next step that we are to take is, we have faith that you've led each of those steps up until this point. You've always fed us. We've always spoken when the time was right. And so we can have faith that that will continue on into the future um, when we need it the most. In Jesus' name we pray. 
All right, guys, you're going to take these down. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word, to delve into all of the things that you have said throughout the ages, and to think again about what it is you may even say to us now, or be saying to us now. Help us open our hearts, our minds, our souls to hear what it is that you would be speaking to us this day and all days through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul panteth for thee, my God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When can I go and meet him? So begins Psalm 42, which stood for our call to worship this morning. I wish that I could say that I reversed the bold and the unbold to prove a point. Um, I didn't do it on purpose, but it does in some ways show exactly what I am going to say today. Because when things happen that are unexpected, it throws us for a loop. We usually know that bold means everyone speaks and non-bold means the leader speaks. But when they're shifted in order from what we expect, we get lost. I chose Psalm 42 because it represents at its base the topic we're going to delve into this morning. This past week, we have been looking at what God does. We've seen God creating, delivering, redeeming, providing, remaining steadfast, and even destroying and bringing about justice this week. Each has given us a glimpse into the character of God, hopefully drawing us nearer because that is our goal not to understand fully how could we ever, but to be constantly approaching, drawing near. In the kids' packet for this week, they looked at the 23rd Psalm. The idea of God is my shepherd, and they looked at what is the duties and actions of a shepherd, and how does that teach us about the character of God. This week, we shift our focus from what God does to what God says, what we see God saying within the context of the Bible. Again, God says so much within the pages of the Bible that you could spend a lifetime trying to study um, and read it all. What we are doing in this study, though, is an invitation. It's a beginning. It's a survey. It's a, so instead of looking at each and every post, how could we do that in a week, each and every time he speaks, we instead create categories that help us to, to conceptualize and think. Um, we're going to look at the main types of things that we see God saying, but even this is not an exhaustive list. There is much that we are leaving out. Think about God speaking in the Bible, all the times that God speaks First and foremost, he speaks things into existence. He says, let there be light. He says, let us create man in our image. And then he saw everything from that day first to day six, said, this is good. This is very good. All speaking. We'll look at God and the commandments that he speaks. The 10, all of the Mosaic law, Everything from be fruitful and multiply to love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. 
We'll look at God and the covenants that he speaks, from Noah all the way to Jesus and the cup. We'll look at the words of warning that he gives through the prophets. We'll look at the words of comfort that he also gives through the prophets. And then lastly, the end of the week on Saturday, we'll look at how God speaks to us in prayer still today. And it is there I want to focus this morning, um, for this is the one that is brought to us in the here and now, in the very much in the midst of our lives, um, no matter where we are, God is speaking still. We ask the question this morning, because I've just made the statement, we ask the question first, does God still speak? Think about the different ways that we see God speak in the Bible. Audible voice, dreams, burning bush, through angels, through prophets, through an inner voice, all the times that Jesus speaks. And even the Bible itself, we understand to be God's word. How do these apply to us in our day? Often we hear about, God, about prayer being a conversation between ourselves and God. A conversation, though, is a two-way street. Do we find ourselves hearing God in the context of our prayers? Do you hear God? Do you listen? What do you do to listen? If you do hear God, is he ever also sometimes silent? I think our answers to these questions are personal to ourselves. They might be private to ourselves. Our relationship with God might be something that we tend to keep quiet we think to Jesus' directives about praying in secret. We wonder about the genuineness of people who are constantly talking about how God says, told me this, and God told me that. And God, We sometimes wonder about how genuine that is. We all have different comfort levels with such things and talking about such things. But I think no matter where we are coming from, no matter where we are on that spectrum, we, like the psalmist of Psalm 42, we long, we thirst, we very much need the intimacy of a conversation with God. We need it. And all signs seem to point to prayer, but I don't think prayer is a prescription to hear God. I think rather prayer is a description about what hearing God is. Let me get at, I think you'll get at the difference as we go on. I want to introduce now, though, our lessons. The first one from Matthew, from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this. This is chapter 7, 7 and 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. If we apply this to prayer... It would seem that there must be something actively that we can do to hear God, if that's what we're seeking. All we must do is ask, all we must do is seek, all we, what we, we must do is knock. Ask and it will be given, seek and you, and you will find, knock and the door will be open. So if we are that deer panting for the water, all we need to do is ask, seek, and knock. And our soul will be quenched, and the conversation can begin. There need no, be no elaborate setup, no special way of holding your hands folded. 
not piously clapped together, turned outstretched, uplifted to the heavens. We don't necessarily need to bow our heads. We don't need to close our eyes. We don't need to look upward yearningly like this. There's no special voice that we need to use. There's no breathy introduction like, Father God, speak. There's no magic words. There's no closing argument. There's no hocus pocus invitation. There's no prompting. There's no right or wrong questions to ask. Just ask, to seek, to knock, and given, finding, door opening, all of that stuff happens high, God. We don't have all of those concepts that we have about prayer. Do they necessarily bring us to that place where we can hear? Because if that's so, that would be great, right? If all of those things we could do, that would be great because that would be something that would be in our control. We could do those things and we could conjure up God all day, anytime that we wanted, on our own schedule. We ask, we seek, we knock. But in our hearts, in our honest place, what are we seeking? What are we hoping to find? And on what door do we find ourselves to actually be knocking? That's an important question. What do we want? Now, I'm going to put something out here that's going to show my age. And it's going to, for those that are young, it's going to show me as old. And for those that are older, it's going to show me as young. But somewhere between record players and MP3 files, there was things known as tapes. And I'm of the tape generation. So, I'm going to be talking about a song by the Bangles. Now, this song wouldn't be known by anyone today because if you wanted to hear Walk Like an Egyptian, you could just play Walk Like an Egyptian. And if you wanted to play Manic Monday, you could play Manic Monday. On the tape, though, Walk Like an Egyptian was side A, song number one, and Manic Monday was song side B, song number one. So you had to do a lot of fast forwarding and rewinding if you wanted to listen to that thing over and over again. So eventually what you decided to do was stop rewinding and just listen to the whole thing. And you were a captive audience. And if you had that Bangles tape, <laughs> which I think was called Different Light, because there was that other song somewhere on the side B that was, I see you in a different light. You know, like, so there was that. Also, on some of the nine songs that you wouldn't listen to today, was another one called If She Knew What She Wants. And that was, if she knew what she wants, she'd be giving it to her, but the idea is that she doesn't know what she wants at all. And I thought to myself, hmm, ask, seek, and knock. If we actually knew what we wanted, that might be helpful in this construct. We don't know what we want. Our soul seems to, right? Our soul seems to truly thirst for God like the deer panting for the stream. But our minds, our hearts, everything else about us has much more specific wants and needs that are limited to our perspective. Right? So when we come to prayer, we pray for stuff. I don't know about you, but I sometimes pray lying in bed. Usually it's because I can't sleep. And when I do, there's lots going on up top here, right? And I pour it all out. God, please. God, please. God, please this. God, please that. And I might actually fall asleep still saying please without ever once stopping to listen. Have you ever been there? You seek something specific from God, and you don't seek anything else. You are sure that you have the rest of it figured out, and you just want this one specific thing. You know what you want, you ask for that thing, but it isn't what you really need. 
beyond the moment, just in the moment. Or maybe you just ask, God, speak to me. Say something. God, please just speak to me. Let me know you were there. And you're looking for something specific to happen in response to that question, let me know you were there. You want a little bell to go off, ding, Bob. You want the house shake. You want it all to like change and Jim. But that doesn't happen. At least not immediately. So you give up patience and you give up entirely. So sure that God doesn't speak to you anymore. Because it wasn't what you expected. You didn't see it and you didn't hear it. All the time there was something else going on entirely. What do you mean? Okay, what do I mean? That's the question we're getting at. Old Testament lesson, here's another one. Elijah, 1 Kings 11, or 19, 11 through 13. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. He even gets an introduction, right? If you got that introduction, you might wait for a little bit longer otherwise, right? Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mountain of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Look here at expectations, right? That's what this is all about, breaking apart. Wind, terribly destructive wind. That must be God. Nope. God's not in the wind. Earthquake, yes. Ground-shaking, earth-shattering, earth-shaking news must be God. Nope. God is not in the earthquake. Fire. Oh, it must be the fire. Because fire is burning hot. We have the image of cleansing fire refining fire, come and mold me fire, fire like glass, like iron, shape me. Nope, God was not in the earthquake, or in the fire either. Instead, the gentle whisper. Now, I hate NIV for this. I absolutely hate NIV. I've always liked the King James Version best, right? The still, small voice. Or the impossible irony of the NRSV, which says the sound of sheer silence. The NIV, like it always does, simplifies any magic out of it completely. Just like it does when it, when it translates Seder into young goat. It takes all the magic out of it to, to allow our modern scientific minds to not have to wonder, to not have to have any mysticalness, it just takes it all out and calls it a gentle whisper. Something that if I'm quiet enough, I can hear a gentle whisper. Right? So the answer to this must be, I need to be completely silent so that I can hear the gentle whisper of God. So that's what you do, right? You be quiet. You be silent. Quiet enough to hear the gentle whisper. I'm too busy. I need to quiet my life. Now, I'm not saying that you don't need to quiet your life. I think that's probably helpful to most of us in the bustling world we live in. A little quiet time can do us all some good. But don't let it be, don't let the silence be another hands folding. Don't make it be another important step that you can control to make sure that you hear God. Don't let it be another conjuring thing. Don't let it be something to coax God out of his hiding place. Like God is that deer. And if we're real silent, he might come and eat out of our hand. Flip that upside down. 
Because you can get as quiet as you want, and you will never hear the sound of sheer silence. It has no sound. It has no sound. <laughs> and you might never hear it because next door is loud. Um, <laughs> That's why I love that NRSV translation so much. The sound of sheer silence because it leaves in the magical, mysterious, elusive character of God that's outside of our definition and it's certainly outside of our methods. I know I've shared this poem before, but I love it. I love what I said when I wrote it. I love what I meant because it's akin to this. This is the should I listen, right? When I sat, shout, shut off all the sounds and there is nothing left to drown out the nothing, I can hear something. I can't help but wonder if the something I hear is just more thunder that I have to get past to hear something else, something more, right? We, he, we like Elijah, are standing there like, was that God? Or is there, is there something more? We question, we, we want, am I doing this right? Right? Am I doing it right? Are my hands perfect? Am... Did my heart just shake? Or was what I felt only an earthquake and not silent nor still enough to be true? Right? We're testing. We're, we're judging. We're trying to figure out whether God's speaking to us or not. I breathe, taking it all in, letting it out. You know, because we're supposed to relax. We've been told we're supposed to relax. Something says, get up. Should I listen? Or should I stay here and wait until I hear more? How do you answer that question? These questions. Was that God? I'm not sure. It might have been. Am I doing this right? I didn't get what I expected to get. My teacher told me to do it this way. My pastor said to do it this way. The pastor on TV said to do it this way. My old pastor said to do it this way. Look at what Paul says. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. He said, she said, they said, the pastor said, the internet said, this, whatever. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What does it mean to renew your mind? To remove all expectations is what it means to renew your mind. Re, to make it new. Renew, again, 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 back to the original. Remove all control, remove all tests, remove all of it. Don't seek the God that you wish to be Seek the God that is. And become receptive, open, and welcoming to whatever that is. We've had great discussion on the Facebook group. Lots of cool threads, good questions, answers, back and forth. One of the posts suggested that our problem of knowing God was due to, being, to God being infinite and us being finite. Reiterated that this morning. Um, that there was too much distance there for us to comprehend. I've been thinking about that a lot. And how it fits here and how this is very much a problem for us. And how what we try to do is make God finite so that we can comprehend him on our terms. And this is where the idolatries come from, right? This is why we put God in a box, because we can understand the box. The limitations help us to be in control, to know what we otherwise can't know. What if we did the opposite, though? What if we sought God in the infinite by come becoming infinite ourselves? Because infinite literally means, just means no ends, right? It means there is no end, no limits, no barriers, no walls, no limited expectations. Open to infinite possibilities of a moment, aware, awake, etc. 
Instead of limiting God, why don't we unlimit our minds a little bit? What if we did that? We talk in football games, I was a coach for a long time, about being aware, having your head on a swivel as a linebacker so that you know what's going on. Eyes open and looking all around, ready for whatever comes so that you can react. The more open, the more ready, the more possibilities you are prepared for, the better equipped you'll be for whatever happens. If you're looking for one play and only one play to come and you're a linebacker, the odds are going to be that you're going to be wrong. You're looking right, the play goes left, and what do you got? You're out of position. But if you can prayer for, prepare for anything that might come, that's another story. So becoming infinite is becoming ready, being ready to react to God however God might enter and speak. Open to the infinite, how could you do that in a moment? Not in bed, with your eyes closed before you go to sleep in specific prayer time, but instead throughout your life. Open and infinite at all times. All times being prayer, not just specified times. Prayer that then becomes a lifestyle with no limits. A living prayer seeking a living God. An unending prayer seeking an unending God. Which is less intimidating way of saying an infinite prayer seeking an infinite God. Not soul. Let's go back to one of the first conversations we are privy to in the Bible. God comes seeking Adam and Eve. They are hiding. God says, where are you? And they hid because they were naked. Look at the expectation that they have invented out of the new depths of their minds. We are naked, therefore we should be ashamed. How interesting that none of that comes from God. He says, who told you you were naked? He doesn't say, come put some clothes on. He says, who told you you were naked? Who put the expectation in your head that I wouldn't like you being naked and that you should hide? Where'd that come from? There are a lot, there's been a lot of back and forth discussions about Cain in the group discussions on Facebook as well. What he was seeking in his offering of his first fruits to God. What did he expect? Because he had to expect something because when God gives him the answer, he doesn't like it all that much. He's not willing to ex accept what the truth is coming from God, so he gets upset and tries to make a new reality. God defies the expectation and catastrophe. The infinite goes up against the finite and expects. It shouldn't. I always think, every time I talk about prayer, I need to bring up my favorite example, which is Huckleberry Finn. Widow Douglas told him to pray for some prey and whatever he wants he would get. So he prays for some fish hooks, and he still doesn't have any fish hooks. And that's why he doesn't put no stock in prayer. If you go to the internet seeking, how can I listen for God? How can I hear God when I pray? There are 1,000 at least how-tos, and they all place the expectation of God in the hands of the reader, in our hands. If you do this, God will show up. If you pray this, God will show up and speak. <clears throat> when God speaks... Will you hear it if it's not what you expect? My dog showed me another sign of this this morning. I throw the ball for her every time down the little hill. But this morning, there's a lot of mud at the bottom of that hill because that's where all the water goes. So I decide to throw it in another direction. And she goes bolting down the hill, expecting it to be there. It's not. And where it is, she can't see it. 
And she won't look anywhere else except down that hill. She's a lab. Not real bright. The truth is, I believe God is speaking everywhere, but we are blind to it because it doesn't fit into our schedule. It doesn't fit into our box. It doesn't fit into our prayer time. It happens during the space of our lives instead. Think about the Good Samaritan story. The people walking by, the man laying there in the ditch, they walked by because they had important things to do. They could not hear God calling out to them in the person of that man. Where else might our ears and eyes be closed? In that kid's packet, they have to illustrate and illuminate that prayer expressions of faith. The last stanza says this, Lord, you have always spoken when the time was right. Though you be silent now, today I believe. Why is that an expression of faith? Because I don't get to con control when God is going to speak and when God is going to be silent. I have to put my faith in everything that has led me to this point, including Jesus Christ dying on the cross and being resurrected. That very thing alone teaches us so much about who God is, what God is about, and how God brings things forward in our lives. You've always spoken when time was ripe. And though you be silent now, today I believe. So you go out and you buy some green bananas. And you want a banana, but they're not ripe yet. And you know if you bite into that thing, it's going to dry your mouth and make you cough. <clears throat> you can't make something that's not ripe, ripe. That prayer is about letting go of expectation and being built up instead by faith. Let us know that God is speaking to us simply because we exist and there is existence, right? We might have been able to look past God not being in the earthquake and the, hurt and the wind and the fire if we had that initial statement that said, hey, God's gonna come by this way, pay attention. We have that. We have that message telling us to be ready for God to speak. We have it. It's there. Let it fill you with faith from every time you've ever tapped into that. To now. One of the amazing things in the Bible that I think is true is that if you look at all the times God speaks, most of them, it's not because the person was looking. It was because God showed up in the middle of their lives and spoke to them in an unmistakable way that they could not run from, they could not mistake, they could not whatever. So be patient, have faith, and listen. Our song that we're about to sing is Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things are added unto you. I think this could be very much similar to seeking the whole of God and allowing all the details to come from let us sing that song together. Um, and I know that it's a little bit blurry on the bulletin copy. Um, but hopefully it's somewhat well known to folks. <laughs> Let's see how it goes.